Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are having a look at the race of evil beings known as the Urukai. Previously we have released a video where we looked at the question of what are the differences between goblins, orcs and Urukai? which I will link below and put an annotation here, but to sum it up quickly, we came to the realization of all goblins are orcs, and all orcs are goblins. All uruks are orcs, but as they are a breed of them, not all orcs are uruks. Nice and simple for you there. Since then, we have had several requests for a deeper look into each of these breeds. So today I thought it would be good to take the time to have a look at the largest of these types, the Fighting Urukai. Also, just let me quickly pause the video here for a moment to ask all of you viewers. When we look at our analytics behind our videos, we've come to realize that at the moment, over 87% of our views are coming from non-subscribed channels. So if you do subscribe to us, it could massively help us out grow and really fight against that YouTube algorithm, which would just mean so much to us. It means we could bring you really just better and longer content. So please, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button to help us out. But anyway, the Urukai were, as I said, a breed of orc that are said to be harder, better, faster, stronger. But this breed has not been around anywhere near as long as the orc itself. The orcs were brought about at some point during the Great Darkness during the Years of the Trees, which is a time even before the first age of Middle-earth when the Dark Lord Melkor, the Master of Sauron, was in control in Middle-earth. But the full story for the orcs is one for another day, which in fact, if you would like to see that video then please leave me a comment of Orc Maggots in the comment section below. But anyway, a few ages later, the Urukai came to be the third age to be precise, and this is under no doubt really as we actually get no mention at all of the word Uruk in any part of the stories of the Silmarillion. In fact, we get no mention of the word Uruk within the Hobbit either, but then of course we do get the mention of them when we come to the Lord of the Rings, with the first mentioning of this breed coming in the Fellowship of the Ring chapter of the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, when the Fellowship are within the Chamber of Mazarbal. With a quick movement, Gandalf stepped before the narrow opening of the door and thrust forward his staff. There was a dazzling flash that lit the chamber and the passage outside. For an instant, the wizard looked out. Arrows whined and whistled down the corridor as he sprang back. There are orcs, many of them, he said, and some are large and evil, black orcs of Mordor. For the moment they are hanging back, but there is something else, a great cave troll, I think, or more than one. There is no hope of escape that way. From here we get the idea that straight away the Uruk is larger than the standard orc, with them sticking out from the rest of the group to Gandalf. However, when I say larger, they were still not overly large in the sense that they were still shorter than the height of men. So where Peter Jackson created the Uruks to be the height of really the tallest men, they were in fact meant to be more around the height of somewhere in between a dwarf and a man instead. But I do guess in terms of a movie adaptation, to emphasize their greater strength and really just have more of a threat on screen, the added size did make sense. But this is not true to Tolkien's written words. Despite that being the first mention we ever have of the Uruks within the published stories, it is not the first ever recorded appearance of them from Middle Earth histories. That instead comes years earlier, in the year 2475 of the Third Age, over 500 years before the Fellowship entered khazad in the year 3019, and we get this information from Appendix A of the Lord of the Rings within the section of the Stewards. In the last years of Denethor I, the race of Uruks, black orcs of great strength, first appeared out of Mordor, and in 2475 they swept across Ithilien and took Oskilia. Boromir, son of Denethor, after whom Boromir of the Nine Walkers was later named, defeated them and regained Ithilien. But Oskiliath was finally ruined, and its great stone bridge was broken. No people dwelt there afterwards. Now one thing to address here is a question that can often pop up. Are the Uruks and the Urukai the same? or different variations of this breed. 
After all, when talking about the originals that appear, they are always referred to as Uruks. But then later, for example, even in the chapter name from the Two Towers book, they are called Urukai. So, does this hint at a difference of creature, a difference of time, or something else entirely? Well, it does not seem to have ever been 100% confirmed by Tolkien, but it can be safely assumed that the Uruks are the original upgrade on Orcs from Mordor that existed first within the timeline, and then the Urukai are the further improvements to this breed as achieved by Saruman during the War of the Ring. These Urukai would be the ones sent to cause as much damage and inflict as much fear throughout Rohan as possible, and these also would be the ones to capture Merry and Pippin at Amon Hen after slaying Boromir, as revealed in the Lord of the Rings chapter of the Urukai. We are the fighting Urukai. We slew the great warrior. We took the prisoners. We are the servants of Saruman the Wise, the White Hand, the hand that gives us man's flesh to eat. We came out of Isengard and led you here, and we shall lead you back by the way we choose. I am Uglok. I have spoken. These Urukai of Saruman would have an S elf rune on the front of their iron helms in a white metal, with it clearly showing that Saruman was basically marking his soldiers. And to go with this S, they were also given the symbol of a white hand on their shields, so as not to be confused with those bearing the symbol of the red eye of Sauron on theirs, usually on their shields as well. These Urukai would also consider themselves as superior to lesser orcs with an example of how coming from Appendix F of the Lord of the Rings section of Of Other Races, where it talks about Orcs and the Black Speech. Orcs and the Black Speech Orc is the form of the name that other races had for this foul people as it was in the language of Rohan. In Sindarin, it was Orch. Related, no doubt, was the word Uruk of the Black Speech, though this was applied as a rule only to the great soldier Orcs that at this time issued from Mordor and Isengard. The lesser kinds were called, especially by the Urukai, Snagger, Slave. So you can see how they referred to the standard orc as basically a slave, also with a part of their superiority coming in the weapons that they wielded as well. They would not arm themselves in the exact same way that an orc would, which is what would clearly tell them apart if you're not looking at their height. The Uruks were long-armed and crook-legged, and armed themselves with short, broad-bladed swords, as opposed to the curved scimitars of the Orcs. Now I will not pretend I know enough about swords, but I believe that this choice would come down to a broad-bladed sword being a more ideal weapon for warriors who are engaged in closer combat to their opponent, which would give them an advantage over enemies who carry long-bladed swords when closing the distance perhaps in situations where they would be attacking people within their homes or other smaller places. It's perhaps just an idea of why they wielded the different sword. But it was not just their swords that were different, for instead of the shorter orc bows, the Uruks would use greater bows made of yew wood, so in other words, long bows that were far more similar again to those used by men. Then there was a big factor in their improvements that helped them stand head and shoulders above the orc and that was their ability to withstand the sun. Admittedly, they still did not like the sunlight, but they could withstand it far more than the other standard orc, and this gave them the ability to travel further and faster without them weakening. And another fun fact here, if you can really call this a fun fact at all, is that the Urukai bred by Saruman were motivated by the promise of being fed man flesh upon their return from a successful mission. So in other words, being fed men as a treat. A massive pointer if you really needed another one to show just how far Saruman had fallen from the once angelic being he had once been. Now before we approach the end of this video I would like to take a journey towards the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, specifically today looking at the letters 66 and 78, both of which were written in the year 1944 to his son Christopher Tolkien. These are the only two of his letters where I could actually find any mention of the word Uruk, and I found them quite interesting so I thought they would be worth sharing with you all today on how he used this term in these letters to his son. Firstly we will look at letter 66 of which was written on May 6th 1944, and in this one he discusses how real life is not quite like a story, there are challenges and threats, but yet you can still make your own happy ending. Not that in real life things are as clear cut as in a story, 
and we started out with a great many oars on our side. Well, there you are, a hobbit amongst the Urukai. Keep up your hobbitry and heart, and think that all stories feel like that when you are in them. You are inside a very great story. You are a hobbit amongst Urukai. I really do like that saying, and it is something great for everyone to remember. Keeping a good heart is really a great thing. But then if we move on now to letter 78 as well, with this one being written on the 12th of August 1944. In this one, again, Tolkien compares Uruks to the evil of the world. And of course, as you already discover, one of the discoveries of the process is the realisation of the values that often lurk under dreadful appearances. Urukai is only a figure of speech. There are no genuine Uruks, that is folk made bad by the intention of their maker, and not many who are so corrupted as to be irredeemable. Though I fear I must be admitted that there are human creatures that seem irredeemable short of a special miracle. You see how Urukai really are the representation of real life evil people to Tolkien, but used only as a figure of speech. Tolkien still believed, despite writing this letter during the time of World War II, that there was not really anyone who was irredeemable, even if it would have taken a special miracle in some of those cases. Uruk seemed to be just that figure of evil that Tolkien had seen in his life, and how, maybe over time, that evil had almost improved upon itself in the way that war had just become a more terrible evil as time had gone on too, and perhaps this is where Urukai came into things. But really, and I will emphasise this here, that is just my own interpretation on what was said. I'm sure many of you will have completely opposite thoughts, similar thoughts, slightly different thoughts, but everyone is entitled to take their own opinions and different things from it. But I am sure we all can agree that no matter what, Uruks and Urukai just represent evil. So anyway, there we have it, a look at just what the Uruks and the Urukai are, with a little dive into how Tolkien would use them in terms in his letters as well. The Uruks were upgrades on the original evil soldiers of Orcs, with Saruman coming in to improve them once again to breed his fighting Urukai in the Lord of the Rings. Although they are shown as larger beings in the movies, as opposed to quite how they are described in the books, we can still pretty safely agree that they would be terrifying foes to come up against in battle. So now that we have rounded that up, it is time for my end question for you all today, and that is, how do you feel about the way the Uruks were shown within the Peter Jackson adaptation movies? Did you like that they were given a greater size and threat, or do you wish that he had stuck more to the books and made them really just a bit bigger than a dwarf, a bit shorter than a man? I'd be very curious to hear all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below, so please let me know. And also another reminder here, if you are part of that over 87% of viewers from non-subscribed channels, then please hit that subscribe button. And now that we have reached the end of the video, I would like to also remind you all, we do not just have this one channel, but also three others as well, and they are the Tabletop Alliance for all things tabletop gaming, the Sixth Ranger for all things Power Rangers, and History of Dragon Ball for all things Dragon Ball. Links for all of those channels will be in the description below if any of those may interest you. And now to shout out our patrons. Firstly, our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Abram, Matt, and Glorfindel of Gondolin. You are all awesome. And a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheath, Denver Steel, and Gregory. And as well, I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Pirate747 as well. None of you come close to being anything like an Uruk, as you are all true legends of the Brohirrim. And then finally, if you have not already as well, like I've said before, please do all the great stuff, hit the like button on the video, subscribe to the channel, you know all the things to do by now. So thank you if you have managed to reach the very end of this video with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.